Hey guys, so a lot of you in the community have been asking about a video tutorial of how to install Draugr OS. So in this video we're going to go over step by step how to make a bootable USB all the way through booting Draugr OS from that USB drive to installing Draugr OS for the first time. So let's hop right into it. So as you can see over here, I already have Etcher open. Um, if you don't have this already it, or know what it is, Etcher is an open source application that runs on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And it allows you to take ISO or IMG files and flash them to SD cards or USB drives. You get the idea. And, and what you can do with those is boot from them and uh, if you've ever used a Raspberry Pi or had to flash something like Raspbian or Armbian or uh, Manjaro uh, Arm to an SD card to boot on that Raspberry Pi, this is probably what you used. So what we do is, I'm assuming here you've already downloaded the latest ISO of Draugr OS from our website, draugrOS.org. And once you've downloaded it, make a note of where it is. And we have Etcher open hit flash from file and navigate to where it is. So this is my latest ISO. Open it up. Now select target. You want to be very careful which device you click here. This right here is the USB drive I want to flash to. So I'm going to click that. This source drive, you need to keep that in mind because uh, that tells you which drive the ISO is actually on. And if you try to write to the drive that the ISO is already on, then you're going to have an error midway through. Um, it will also hide some drives. So like this one is my boot drive. And it's also registered as a source drive. So it's not going to be read. Uh, it's not going to show up. And anything over about 64 gigs is going to show up as a large drive. Uh, and that's just so that you don't accidentally flash it to an external hard drive or something like that. So I have my USB drive selected and hit that. And then all I have to do is hit flash and type in my password. Alrighty, so we are now flashing the ISO file to the flash drive. And this can take anywhere from about two minutes to about five minutes. It depends on um, how old your flash drive is, what kind of flash drive it is, stuff like that. So I'm using a USB 3.0 flash drive. And because we're only flashing about two gigabytes here, this shouldn't take too terribly long, especially considering USB 3.0 is faster than USB 2.0. So this normally doesn't take very long. As you can see, we're already at 41% and going pretty quickly at about, uh, about 12 megabytes a second. And it even gives you an ETA right here. Um, once it gets done flashing, it will go through that uh, device it's just flashed and it will make sure that the integrity is good and if something looks wonky or if it failed partway through the flash it'll let you know all right so we're about done flashing now and once it gets done it'll do that validation validation usually takes way less time than it does to actually flash and as you can see it's going way faster already All right, and as you can see, we finished up one uh, one flash. They gave us a green check mark and said that we have we had a successful flash. So as you can see here, we have Rufus up on a Windows installation, and as you can see underneath the device header, we it already has detected our flash drive. And we're going to select our ISO image. And you can change the partition scheme, but we typically leave it in BR. Leave target system as UEFI. You can change the volume label if you want, but there, you don't really need to. Basically, you just need to hit start and then select DD mode. This is very important. Otherwise, the bootable USB drive will not boot. Just hit OK. 
it'll give you a quick warning. Just hit OK. And then it will do its thing. And this normally doesn't take very long, thankfully. Uh, just make sure you hit that DD option and you should be good to go. Now, booting to this newly flashed USB drive is going to be different for every device. Normally, what you need to do is you need to completely shut down the device, plug it into a USB port, and then as you boot it up, hit one of either Escape, um, F2, F10, uh, F12, or Delete keys. And what key it is exactly varies from device to device. Uh, so I'm not going to go into that here because of how that varies, uh, but I will show you what to do after that. Alrighty, so what I have booting here is a virtual machine with 8 cores and 8 gigabytes of RAM and a 64 gigabyte SATA drive. Now I'm just going to quickly boot to this device and all right. So this pulled up the live images uh, grub menu. And you'll see there are three options here. Drugger OS 751 Live, uh, 751 Safe Graphics, and 751 Live Debug. Debug is meant more for development purposes or if you are trying to roll your own ISO, uh, then that'll give you a great way to look and see if there's any weird underlying bugs but most people aren't going to need this unless they're having some really, really weird bug that they think is uh, due to something very low level in code. If you are running an NVIDIA graphics card, you need to more than likely choose the safe graphics option. I, both of my main computers have a GTX 1050 Ti and the other one is an RTX 2080. For both of them, I need to choose the safe graphics. But most people can just choose the normal Drugger OS 751 Live, and that goes for if you're in a VM, or if you have Intel graphics, or AMD graphics. Any of those three, you can just choose that top one and you're good to go. So since this is in a VM, I'm going to choose that top one, and we're going to let it boot. This may take a second or two, but after not too long, we get the desktop. Now, as I said, it's running at 1024 by 768, so I'm going to quickly change my display settings. And there's our welcome screen. I'll minimize that for now. Alrighty. So, welcome to Drogger OS 751. And this window right here that we saw pop up earlier will pop up. Uh, it'll also pop up after installation. And what this is doing is it's trying to get you acquainted with the operating system if you're not used to it. So if you're going to install Draugr OS, you will find right here on the desktop, install Draugr OS. I'll actually move it over here to the middle. And you can just click that, or you can go in here go down to system and it's right here install Draugr OS uh, but I imagine most people will use the desktop icon so just click that now sometimes there is a small very very small chance that you'll have a warning pop up saying that you have a kernel mismatch if that's the case don't bother going any farther just send a message to developers letting them know that you've had a kernel mismatch and they will more than likely update the ISO image on the website, so you'll require a re-download and have to go through all these steps again, but it will be fixed. But we haven't had this here. Uh, as I said, it's a very unlikely bug. Um, and it'll give you some information about partitioning. And for most people, they'll just want to hit OK and go from there. So, in keyboard. In here, if you do not see your model then just scroll down until you find do not configure keyboard keep kernel key map. For most people, that is the best option if they do not see it. I happen to always choose 
way up here at the top, Acer laptop. Even if it's not an Acer laptop, and it tends to work just fine. This is more for documentation purposes, from what I understand. Um, if you know more about it, feel free to let me know if, the, if I happen to be wrong about that. Now, layout, this is basically where you should choose whatever language you typically write in on your computer. Um, so I speak and write in English, and I'm here in the US, so I will click English US. And then in the variant menu, they will give you all the variants of that language keyboard language um, that you can choose from. So right here we see the English US variants. If I were to change this to English UK, we can see all the English UK variants. So I typically choose the English US Euro on five, uh, but most people just the standard English US option is what they should choose. There's also the Dvorak options if you use Dvorak or Colmac if you use that. Uh, and there's also Macintosh if you happen to be installing Drogger OS on a Mac computer. But I'm going to choose my typical Euro on 5 option because what that makes it gives me the ability to do is hit the right Alt key and then hit 5 and it'll input a Euro key for me without much hassle. So just hit OK and I'll take you back to the main menu and it'll say complete here. Language and time zone. So Again, just put in your language. This will probably, in the future, auto default to whatever you selected in the keyboard menu. But for right now, you do need to set it in here. Now, region and subregion. The region is used to narrow down uh, your different time zones. So, for instance, I'm in the US, so I could choose the America option. But if you're in the US, there's this little US option down here. And if I ever click America for a moment, you can see there's a lot of options. Now I'm on the East Coast. So what I would typically do is scroll down until I see New York right there. However, you saw how much scrolling that was. So it's much faster if you hit US. And then if you're on the East Coast like I am, just hit Eastern. If you're on the West Coast, then you can do Pacific. And then there's also Mountain Time, Hawaii, Central, Arizona, Alaska, etc. I'm going to hit Eastern because I'm on the East Coast and then hit OK. Options. So the options, Restricted Extras uh, will install Restricted Proprietary Media Codecs. If necessary, it'll install the Broadcom Wi-Fi drivers and it will install the latest NVIDIA graphics driver. If you have an older NVIDIA graphics card, you might want to go to NVIDIA's website and search for your graphics card and make sure that it's actually supported by the latest Linux x86 NVIDIA graphics driver. Because if it's not, then it's installing a graphics driver that you can't use. Update before reboot. What this will do is it will update your system all the way to the latest software during installation. Now, some of our more advanced users in the audience may know that on Ubuntu, when you tell it to download updates, that's all it does is it downloads them. That's not the case here. In this instance, it actually downloads all those updates and installs them. So, that's the difference to keep in mind here from normal Ubuntu. Uh, most users, I would suggest clicking that. If you have an NVIDIA graphics card and you know the latest graphics driver supports your graphics card, so if you have a eight or nine series, 900 series NVIDIA graphics card or later, so all the way to 10, 20, 30 series, newer if you're seeing this way far in the future, definitely select that it'll make your installation process much easier. Enabling auto login. Now, that does not require internet unlike the other two, but what this will do is, if you're just testing it out right now, just testing out Drogger OS, hitting that will make it so that once you reboot, it'll auto log in on the installed system. I'm gonna leave all of these disabled so that we can see the lock screen once we finish booting. 
So I'm just going to hit OK, and it's perfectly fine to leave everything unselected. Now here comes the important part, partitioning. Now, I want to draw your attention to the node. Auto partitioning takes up an entire drive. There's nothing you can do about this. It's due to the way our auto partitioner is set up. It's just easier to just completely wipe an entire drive with you knowing that that is going to happen and do what we need to to get Drawder OS up and running on that fresh empty drive than it is to look at a drive and go, okay, there's all these other partitions. We need to place a Drawder OS installation around these partitions. If you're uncomfortable with that, then do the manual partitioning step. It's not that hard. We'll go through that here in a moment. If you're uncomfortable with manual partitioning and you don't want to do auto partitioning, then you can hit exit and it will completely back out of the installation. If you hit exit though, you need to keep in mind that it will lose all your settings so far and you have to put them in all over again. So for right now, let's look at auto partitioning. Auto partitioning is very simple. All you have to do is tell it which drive you want to install to. So I'm going to tell it SDA because it's 64 gigabytes and whether or not you want a separate home partition. Now when you click that, right here it's saying that you want it to make one. When you hit the pre-existing box, what it will do is go, okay, there's already a home partition somewhere that we can use. And it will give you a list of pre-existing partitions. So here we see SDA1 and SDA2 because those are the only actual partitions that we can use. If you have a pre-existing RAID array, it needs to be set up to where there is a partition on each drive that does that array, that, that does that RAID array. However, we don't have that set up here. So we're not going to do a home partition at all, because if you do a home partition, that makes installation take a little bit longer. Now, if you want to make some space for it to make its job easier, you can hit make space and then select the drive you want to delete from. And then it'll show you all the partitions on that drive. So here with SDA, we can see the two partitions. With SDB, there's nothing. And the same thing with C, D, and E. Now this SR0 is the disk drive. It's not going to show anything in there. So I'm going to delete SDA1. As soon as you hit this delete, it deletes the partition. So I hit delete. That partition is now gone. It gives you no confirmation. This confirm There will be a confirmation menu in a future version. But for right now, there is none. So you need to be sure that you are doing, that you are sure about this. So there's, now there's no more partitions. I can just tell it dev SDA and hit okay. Easy peasy, it'll work from there. In manual partitioning, you will have a window in Gparted open to the right, and you'll have another window over here to the left. Now. It's very important to remember here how you do this. So I booted the system using UEFI. And right here we see a boot EFI option. These are where the partition should be mounted once the system boots. So at the very least, because I booted using UEFI, I have to use these two. If you are booting using BIOS, you only have to use the top one. So this has been tested using ButterFS, EXT2, 3, and 4, JFS, Minix, Riser, FS, and XFS. Everything we have tested with has worked as root. However, we strongly suggest using EXT4 as your root partition. And the reason I say that is because even though ButterFS has more features and XFS has more features and some of these other partitioning schemes 
may be faster. EXT4 has the greatest combination of journaling, so that gives you better data integrity, performance, and features. It's the easiest and most robust file system to use on Linux, and that's the one we suggest using for your home partition or for your root partition. So I'm going to do that. Now, because I'm using UEFI, I need to make sure I have enough room left after I make this partition to actually make a UEFI partition. This needs to be at least 200 megabytes, but I'm going to do 500 for just reasons. So there's that one. And then, so because this one's going to be my EFI partition, this needs to be FAT32. You can give these names if you want, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But you do need to make sure that your UEFI partition, you right click and you hit manage flags and hit boot. Now, now what you need to do is put the partition name into these boxes that you want to use. So for my root partition, this forward slash, I want to use dev sda1. So I'll type in dev sda1. In my EFI partition, I want to be dev sda2. If you made a home partition, then you would pop that in there like I did for these two. And if you want a swap partition, then you would pop in the partition path here as well. If you don't put anything in for your swap partition, it will automatically make a swap file. So I'm going to leave that empty because I'm okay with that. And now that this over here has been applied, I can close it. Finally, user settings. So here's where you set your name, the computer's name, and your password. All right, so after I hit OK, on the last one, it takes me back to the main screen. This is so that if you want to, you can go through all of these options and double check them if you want. Once you're sure about everything, just hit Done, and you'll get this new window. It'll show you all the partitioning settings, your language, time zone, computer name, and it will then also show you your username, your password. This is a test virtual machine, so I'm not worrying about the password. However, you should know it will show this in plain text. The reason it's doing this is it wants you to know what your password is. There will probably be a button in the future to where you can toggle whether this is plain text or not. But for now, this is plain text so that you know what your password is, even if you typed it wrong, both on in the initial password dialog and the confirmation. And at any rate, it'll give you the auto login and all the other options. Once you're happy with that, just hit install now and you'll get this uh, window popping up. If you see this right here, don't worry. Don't worry about these GTK critical errors. These are all normal. This is just from bugs in the UI. Now, right now we're not seeing anything because the output's being redirected to the wrong place, but uh, we can see now things are moving and it's giving us an output of the terminal so we can see what exactly is being done on our system. Now this time, this uh, percentage bar may jump around a little bit. Uh, it'll probably fall, yep, it fell back to about 66%. It'll jump back up here later. This is just because the installation is multi-threaded and it, it reports different percentages on different threads. So it'll fall back at some point and then jump back up forward later. Um, right here, it can't take any of the input. Don't worry, it's not an issue. Uh, as we can see, the percentage jumped back up and this shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Um, our system installation utility is actually most efficient on a CPU with 10 cores or more. And as we can see now, it's installing our bootloader. 
and we are done. Now, we highly suggest that you send an installation report. And this is opt-in, and you can see what all you can send, and you can opt out of whatever. We strongly recommend at least sending the installation log, and the reason for that is everything that you saw on that terminal is what's in that log. You know, there may be some stuff you may have missed because it was going so fast, but whatever was in that terminal screen is what we see in that log. There is no personal identifying information. The name of your computer is in that log, but that's it. The disk and partitioning info would be where everything is mounted, how many disks you have in your system, stuff like that. Uh, the RAM and swap info would be how much RAM your system has and how much swap was created during installation. GPU and PCIe info gives basically every device hooked into the PCIe bus on your computer. Um, we're mainly looking at what GPU you have, but if you happen to have issues with your Wi-Fi card, then we can use this info to see what Wi-Fi card you have and determine if there's support for that in the kernel or if you need to install a proprietary driver. CPU info basically just gives us what CPU you have. And from there, we can pull whatever information we want about that CPU. And typically all we want is the number of cores, whether it has hyper-threading, base and boost clock, and the amount of cache. That's really it. And then finally, the custom message. Here, if you want to send us a message, you can do that. Just delete all this and type whatever you want to say. So, hi. Boom. And once you're done, just hit preview message. And it'll give you a preview of what's going to be sent. And this right here is exactly what we're going to see. So right here we can see when the installation was being done. This timestamp is wrong. Uh, we can see the system installation utility version. So we know if you're using an older ISO image or not. And if you've encountered any bugs, if it's a bug in the current ISO. We can see what CPU you have because this is in a VM. This is giving a weird uh, output. We can see all of this stuff, and as you can see here, this is the GPU under that VGA compatible controller. We can see how much RAM we have, like I said, 8 gigabytes, and we can see the amount of swap we have now, so that's 10.6 gigs. We can see all the drives available and where partitions are mounted. And then this is the installation log right here. And you can just, you have to scroll past all of this, unfortunately to get to the bottom. And then at the bottom, it just uh, gives a custom message. And if you're happy about it, you can just hit send report. If you decide you don't want to send it because you see something that you didn't think should be in there, you can hit abort and it will take you right back to the main screen right here. Now in advance, you can dump your settings for the installation to a file. This is great if you're just tinkering around and you think you might break something later. You can add a PPA if you want, or you can just straight up delete the installation if you wanted to see how fast it was. And then, of course, restarting the system just immediately restarts it. And then if you hit exit, it just exits the installation, and you can continue using the live system as normal. So I'm going to hit restart, and it'll go from here. And it'll give this, just hit enter after pulling it out. All right, so upon first boot, you'll get a menu like this. It'll say reboot into firmware interface if you can do that, and then Drogger OS recovery and Drogger OS. Now, it'll look like this at first without the text at the bottom because we can't unfortunately set the default boot entry uh, from the installation because of certain reasons. To set the default boot entry, just highlight Drogger OS and hit D, and you'll get this thing at the bottom saying default boot entry selected, and then just hit enter, and it will boot using system D boot. 
our default bootloader on UEFI. Now, if you had installed on, on a BIO system, it would be using Grub. Now, as we saw, that was lightning fast because of that bootloader and because of the number of cores we have. And so it's not showing the proper wallpaper right now because it's first boot. But we can just quickly log in. And again, it's at 1024 by 768, so we can quickly fix that. And like I said, there's our welcome screen. And Steam is now asking to install because it's in an, on an installed system. So we're going to close that, and we're going to tell this not to pop up. And you're free to use Jogger OS. It is completely installed, and I can even pull up a terminal, and I can show you guys the kernel. I can show you guys this is, if I can type, indeed Draugr OS, and I can check for updates. And so if you want one of those nice little terminal output things, then all you have to do is install NeoFetch. And voila, there we go. Draugr OS is installed in our virtual machine here. So yeah, that's all you need. That's it, guys. And I'll just show you real quick that when you go to log out, the uh, login screen every time after that first login will show the correct wallpaper. Uh, this is a known bug. It's just a bug that we haven't really bothered messing with because it's only the first login. So, thanks for watching, guys. And with that, have a good one and enjoy Draugr OS.